you have your Bibles, open them up to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 will pick up where we uh, left off with the Advent reading this morning. <coughs> Pretty soon we're going to be singing songs full of joy and goodwill like those this morning and love and peace. And someone asked some little children what love is is and one said love is what you hear in the house at Christmas time if you stop opening presents and listen for a while <laughs> I know what it's like in your home in our home it gets pretty chaotic with the children and uh, it gets earlier and earlier it seems every year I'm getting older and older every year they uh, wake up and uh, last year I know it was before the sun had come up that they were up mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sure this year we're going to have the same. But it's not always that way. Uh, there's estrangement in the world against uh, peace. Uh, there's hostility. There are things that the world uh, struggles with. And it's painful uh, sometimes to, to think about at Christmas time. But the scripture verse that was read this morning is a, a prophetic verse on the hope of Jesus Christ coming uh, and this promise that is given to us. Church, catch this. It's not a thing. It is a promise that is given in Jesus Christ. And this is what I'd like to speak this morning about. If you have your Bibles in Romans chapter 15, we're going to pick up right where uh, we left off this morning in verse 14. It says, and concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. But I've written very boldly to you on some points, so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given to me from God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, and my offering of the Gentiles might become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power and signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and around about, as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, that I might not build upon another man's foundation. But it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. For this reason I have often been hindered from coming to you, but now with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come and see you, Wherever I go to Spain, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. For Macedonia and Micaiah and have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Therefore, when I have finished this, and I have put my seal on this fruit of, you, of theirs, I will go on by way of you to Spain. And I know that when I come to see you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers. To God for me, that I may be delivered from those who are disobedient in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints, so that I may come to you in joy, the will of God, and find refreshing rest in your company. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul gives us prayer and 
one of his most important letters to the church at Rome. And if you're uh, participating on Wednesday nights, we're meeting this Wednesday night where we're going to continue our study in Romans. It's an exegetical study. We, we go into it in depth. I'd invite you to come try that out one time if you've not been a part of it. It starts at 6. Paul's writing, and it's critical because this, this letter to Rome, to the church at Rome, was to a church that was divided because of the conflict that was going on inside. There was hatred among the people that were sitting in the pews together. Uh, it was traditionally a Jewish church started in Rome, and it had fallen away because the Caesar had made the Jews leave Rome, and they had to go away for a year. When they came back, the entire church had been uh, continued to grow, but underneath Gentile rule. So the Gentiles, not part of the, to, uh, not part of the Israelites, uh, were in conflict there, and they had a Gentile preacher, and they had Gentile deacons, and. And they came back into the situation and there was a lot of animosity and a lot of struggle in between these two people groups. And our world is, is at struggle with this idea of hope, this idea of peace that has been given us in, in Jesus Christ. Maybe there's some tension in your own life this morning between some people you love. Some friends getting a divorce. Maybe some members of your family who are in conflict with one another. Or maybe you have somebody in the family that has separated themselves from the family for some reason. There's always a, a painful uh, time to, to come to grips with this, especially during Christmas. Because we're reminded that that seat is, is not there anymore. They're not sitting with us. We want everyone to, to be a part of that happy circle of, of love, but it, it just doesn't work that way sometimes in this world. It's really painful when you are one of those who are in conflict with someone else, isn't it? When you're the one who is not filling your seat. You're the one who has been separated out. I, I know how that was. I, I remember uh, deciding to follow Jesus Christ instead of following what my dad had offered to me in the way of his business in California. I was supposed to take that over and run that for him. And I decided to go into ministry. And, and I remember having this fight with my father in the middle of the street right in front of his corporate offices and him asking me over and over again how much are they going to pay you to do this and I kept telling him it's not about the money but he kept repeating how much are they going to pay you I said $24,000 a year yes and he said that's the stupidest then he used the F word thing I ever heard in my life. And you're an idiot. And my father didn't speak to me for 16 years. The season creates conflict when we have to address who Jesus Christ is and what he accomplished on the cross. It is in direct conflict with our own self-centered nature. It is in direct conflict with who we are as Christians. If you, church, listen to me, if you put yourself first over your family or over anything else, if you put anything over Christ, if you reprioritize your life to fit a way that you want it to fit, I promise you you're going to come into conflict with who Christ is. I know a lot of people who have come to church and gone away and they've come, they've tried it out and then they left and, and they, they say these little things like hey, Christianity doesn't work for me, it doesn't work I don't think it works it, it, it works brother, let me tell you something you just can't taste test God Christianity works and this thing that he gives us is a promise, it is not a what if what you may be in conflict with is you have not really followed Christ. You have not committed. You have decided to go halfway into this thing and not really embrace what this gift actually is. You can't even focus for the two seconds that possibly we're sitting here because this thing is so loud in your head that you want to divert it away from something else and focus on something else. But the fact is, Jesus Christ was either who he said he was or he's a lunatic. And so this gift that God gives us is something that we have to consider and say, this hope, this peace, this promise that he gives us, 
something that we cannot purchase on our own. The hope for peace. It's more than just a Christmas wish. It's a part of the Christmas promise. It's a part of what we are invited actually to hope for, especially in this season of expectancy. It was part of Paul's vision for the saving work of God, that God is working to overcome all the divisions between the peoples of this earth and to gather them into one harmonious whole. And whether we like it or not, when we get to heaven, there's going to be some people there that you probably didn't think were going to be there. And if God has a sense of humor, they may have the mansion right next door to yours. The letter to the Ephesians speaks of God's plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things to him, things in heaven and things on earth. Ephesians 1.10 says, Paul was especially concerned about the hostility that existed between the Jews and the Greeks. And this is what he was focused on in the book of Romans. Jews and Greeks in his society, it was a bitter division that could turn violent and oftentimes did. And it was probably that same hostility that eventually caused Paul's death in Rome. But Paul found the conflict very painful because he loved both his people whom he grew up in and the people he was called to be a missionary to, the Gentiles. He yearned for their reconciliation to each other. He believed that it had been accomplished or at least made a real possibility. And as part of God's promise through Jesus Christ, it was made possible. And he's writing to the church at Rome saying, look, you can't fight among each other. The gift is for all of us. He writes again in Ephesians, he, meaning Jesus, he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14. And in the letter to the Galatians, Paul shares this vision for something that God has caused him to be true. First in the church and then in the world. He says, there is no longer Jew or Greek. Did you catch this church? Paul, the one called to be a missionary to the Greeks. Paul, the one who is formerly Saul. Paul, the guy who has been versed in in, in the Hebrew language and in the Hebrew culture and is the Pharisee of Pharisees. <coughs> he says there's no longer Jew or Greek. <coughs> I'm sorry. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Doesn't that confront our pride? <coughs> I think it does. In the scripture lesson today, we're coming near the end of Paul's greatest letter. He has witnessed to the good news of God's saving work with great power and clarity throughout the land. Then he moved into several chapters having to do with practical matters on how we are to live our faith out in the real world. And he gives us this example on how to do that. And as he approaches the end of this section, as he approaches this, he quotes three lessons from the Hebrew Scriptures that point forward to a reconciliation between Jews and Gentiles. He culminates all this thing when you look at chapters 1 and 2 in, in the book of Romans. He says, we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. Jews and Greeks are both sinners. He goes in through those chapters following that. He says, salvation has come to all of mankind. Whosoever will, it's open to all of mankind. There's theologians out there today that they exegete scripture and they try to preach a doctrine of, of reform thinking out there. And, and personally, I, these guys are good guys, but they're contextually wrong. Because if Christ did not die for the entire world, we have a huge joke on the cross. If God indeed picked out individuals to be saved rather than all of mankind to give them the opportunity to be saved, then there's a problem with the type of atonement that is accomplished on the cross. The scripture doesn't read it contextually that way. He says all men are infected with sin. All men have been given the opportunity of Jesus Christ. Here's what you need to do. 
And then he's going to culminate in a couple things. And he says this, and this is the tough part as he closes in Romans and he goes to the end of this. This hope that you have, if Jesus Christ is real in your life, the difference between you and the person in the world is that you have unconditional love for your neighbor. You have the capacity to love people unconditionally. Let me ask you a question. Right here, church. Do you have the capacity to love people unconditionally? Now, a lot of us will say, yeah. I don't have any problems with anybody. Do you have a problem with putting yourself first over your family? Do you have a problem with putting yourself first over what God will call you to do? Do you have a problem with, with prioritizing and making sure that God is first, your family is second, and then it's you? Because your ability to love unconditionally comes from your knowledge of understanding of what Christ has done for you on the cross. When we understand that, it gives us a driver to want to share this truth with others. It gives us hope, is what we talked about this morning. Scripture says in Romans 15, 13, that was read this morning as the light of the first advent, candle. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Watch this. Watch this right here. You can't have hope when you fabricate it on your own. You need Christ in you to change those things within you. If Christ is not in you, he cannot change what is in you, and you cannot then know hope. Let me ask you a question. Are you desperate? Do you need hope? I have it on good authority here in the scripture that says you can have that, but he wants you to be all in with your commitment to Christ. You can't try it out. You can't taste test God. In the fifth verse of the 15th chapter, Paul writes before what was read this morning, May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul sees that reconciliation of humankind is a part of the vision and the good future toward which God is moving us, you and I. The part of the hope that should already be shaping our lives. But what does that offer us in the real world today? What can it have to do with those real conflicts that are making our hearts hurt right now? And what can we do about it? You know the conflicts. You're in conflict with maybe somebody in your family. Maybe some friends. You're struggling to fill a void in your life over and over again by doing possibly a habit over and over again, and, and you can't fill it. You, you'll say you're okay right now, but you'll continue to do the same thing over and over again because, in fact, it's not filled. Maybe it's a relationship that you have with somebody and you're looking for a relationship to fill this same kind of thing. And so over and over again, relationship to relationship to relationship, over and over again, it's not being filled. Your marriage is struggling. Your marriage is struggling because you're first, not your family. And so you're looking for self-gratification. You're looking for self-fulfillment in that relationship. You're trying, you're looking at it and you're saying to yourself, I, I'm not fulfilled in this relationship. It must be something. I must have fallen out of love. Brother, sister, you, you never knew what love was. That kind of love is an unconditional love where you put those others first and then they desire to want to love you back because of what you are doing to them. It changes people's lives. I meet people all the time who struggle with, with, with issues or with problems or in relationships and things like that. And as, as they lay down and say, had a real relationship with Jesus Christ, their whole life has been transformed and whole, their whole lives have been changed. 
And then I meet people who experience something like that. They experience an emotional feel of that kind of thing, but they keep going back to the same things. There's something markedly different between these two models. And what separates those two things is Jesus Christ. I know some people who simply fear coming forward to make a commitment. They don't want to make a commitment to Christ. They're afraid that if they do that, they're going to have to change some things in their life. And they know that they love those things so much that they cannot possibly do that. And so they never commit. Well, they want the relationship. They want the benefits of people liking them. But they don't know about this Jesus Christ. There's some things we can do to change that. First, believe the promise and the claim that hope brings peace. When we talk about conflict in the Holy Land, we often hear people say, those people have been fighting over there for years. For thousands of years, as a matter of fact. We can't let ourselves give up on that hope. It happens every day over there. Some of you fought over in Afghanistan, in the Middle East. For those of us who served our country and understand that idea of having to sacrifice like that, you've lived that out. You know that. Imagine that conflict every single day in your life. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 7, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. The Bible tells us that this is going to occur. And you're going to find that Jesus did not say that wars are part of the plan, but rather that when we hear well, wars, rumors of war, Means It doesn't mean necessarily that the world is coming to an end right then, but that it's part of how God is going to use us to get our attention. <coughs> Catch this, church. Our country, I believe, is on the ropes. And we're going to struggle because I believe God is going to use that to bring us to our knees so that we'll look up. And when we look up and we realize, hey, we are going down the wrong road and we finally wake up from that, it is only then that we usually do something. Isn't that true? I mean, how often are we praying when things are going great in our life? Not very often. It's when things are going rough that we hit our knees. And God knows that. He knows that about us. Too. And he wants a relationship that's real. He wants a relationship that's fulfilling. Paul believed that in the church all kinds of people could and should be reconciled and live together in mutual love. He says this is the thing that brings peace. It is part of the promise of God and the trust of the promise is to live expectantly. He spent a lot of time talking about that because he thought it was important. Paul believed that the church should live in the world in a way that would be both an example and an agent of the new possibility God offers to the whole world. When people look at us, do they see Jesus Christ in us? When Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians, about running this race in such a way as to win, and I box not just for no reason at all, and I train for just no reason at all, but I do it so that I would not be disqualified. What he's talking about that to the church at Corinth is this, that oftentimes when we say that we're a Christian and we live an opposite lifestyle, that people look at us and say, if that's what Christianity is, you can keep it. We disqualify ourselves from being an example to Christ. We disqualify ourselves because we didn't run the race in such a way as to win. We ran it the way we wanted to run it. And we didn't run at all. We never committed to Christ. We never understood this peace as a promise. We just thought it as a thing. That perhaps could not be grasped. But God says, no, it can be grasped. Peace can come to the home. Peace can come to your life. And it comes to your life in the person of Jesus Christ. That God would lay a babe in the manger. That he would grow up. And understand that he had to go to the cross on purpose for you and I is a huge, huge thing. 
It's important for us to take seriously reconciliation of our personal lives and our relationships. The place to start is to be reconciled to God. Let me ask you something. Are you struggling with something this morning? Are you struggling in your walk with Christ? Do you not have a walk with Christ? The first thing you have to do is, is say, I, I need to follow you. If you're struggling with something that overrides your walk with Christ, then it's a confession and say, God, I, I cannot fix this in my life. I need you to fix it for me. I repent from that. I will turn my life around in the opposite direction, but I need you to help me. Oftentimes people get stuck right there thinking they have to do that. All you have to do is say, God, I am turning away from it, and I need you to help me do that. And he does that work for you. That's what changes people's lives. But oftentimes people will walk and say, well, I, I think I can handle it on my own. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steer a little bit longer and I'm going to try to control things. And I'll see what's around the next corner. We go around the next corner and we have an accident. We didn't see what was, what was going on. Paradigm shifts in, in the world and all of a sudden we, we find ourselves not being the person we thought we were going to be in third grade when we said we wanted to grow up to be a a firefighter or an astronaut or whatever it was that we wanted to do. And the next thing you know, you said, I I'm not doing those things. This is what I'm doing. And this is my life. Watch this, church. And God says, I can take you right there. And I can give you hope and fulfillment in Christ. But you have to trust me completely. Follow me. It's important. We take that hope seriously. The next step after reconciling relationships is to become a peacemaker. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they are called children of God. Are you a peacemaker? If you're a child of God, you're a peacemaker. If you're a child of God, you're the person who doesn't have an issue with the people sitting to your right and to your left next to you. If you're a child of God, you are the person who is the one who brings peace into the home. If you're a child of God, you are the stabilizer in the workplace. If you're a child of God, you are the one who turns the other cheek over and over and over again. And you smile. And you change that person's life because of what they see in you. And Jesus said, those are my children, the peacemakers. Are you a peacemaker? Or do you struggle with that? Oh, he can't come to this church. He didn't make enough money. He can't come to this church. He's a different color. He can't come to this church. He's an Alabama fan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> it doesn't matter what your issue is or what your angst is. God says if you're his child, you don't have those things with anybody sitting next to you. Amen? You're a peacemaker. And then we should look at ways to move out in the community in which we live and do work as a peacemaker. What would happen if every time you heard somebody bad-mouthing someone with whom they are in conflict. You said something like, you know, you folks need to get over this and, and work things out. I, I try to tell people all the time, when you hear somebody gossiping about something, you need to stop and say, hey, you know what? That's, that's true. Why don't you come with me and let's go sit with uh, whoever it is and let's talk about it to make sure that that is not an ugly thing that you're struggling with. And, and you'd be amazed at how the story changes. <laughs> you'd be amazed if you were the person who says, hey, you know what? You need to get over this and work things out and be with that person. I, I, I want you to go to that person and, and get over it. But you know what happens oftentimes? The person starts talking and you go like this. Really? What, what else did you hear? Yeah, they did that. I had a cousin did that one time. Thanks. And we start getting into it and, and the fervor builds and, and Becomes like shark infested waters and, and everybody's attacking everybody and Satan wins the day. He's destroyed your witness. He's destroyed the church. He's destroyed the community. He's destroyed your family. He's destroyed your integrity. You're labeled a gossip. 
And people look at you and say, if that's what Christianity is, you can keep it. And we just call that ourselves. We hold to the hope and we're peacemakers because of that hope. Christian people and Christian churches ought to be actively involved in working for peace and that it would communicate that in the world we live in, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, between groups that we work with. From helping to establish a climate of opinion that wants peace and justice. When I turn on the news, I get angry sometimes, to be honest with you. I might not agree with everything that the leadership in this nation is doing, but as a Christian man, I'm called to pray for that guy, whether I like it or not. <clears throat> and pray that God will do what he needs to do to get our nation back on track. Watch this, church. God can do a far better job on bringing people to their knees than we can. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so you just pray. You just pray, God, bring that administration to its knees or bring the nation to its knees so that we would wake up and see what you want done in this country. God, what your will is, not mine. Henry Black, we made a good point in his book, Experiencing God. Biblically, the correct question is not that we ask ourselves, what is God's will for my life? That is not the correct question, theologically. The biblical question is, what is your will, God? And then we join him in it, in accomplishing it. Amen? Yeah. There's a purpose that God is going to bring us to our knees. We just better get on our knees and go with him and his purpose. Amen? Peace is a real possibility in our lives and in our world. In a few weeks, when we again hear the scriptures read, in which the angel spoke peace on earth and goodwill among men, we may still experience sadness because we know that peace that we wish for has not yet come to our own little corner of the world or to our families or to our lives. It saddens me every day as a pastor. I, I, I get a lot of texts, a lot of emails from friends and family. And all I can do sometimes is pray for them because they're struggling with so much stuff. And I hate that. I hate that for you. And all I can tell you is you need to have a closer relationship with Christ. Because the closer you walk with him, the easier it is to bring peace in your homes. But sadness doesn't have to lead to despair Because despair is not part of Christian's DNA God is at work in our lives and in our world And that gives us the reason for hope I pray that the God of hope Would fill you with all joy and peace In believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is what the verse was read this morning was about. But here's the deal as we close. In that goofy little sign you see sometimes and you wonder what it was and you just thought it was a cute little statement. It said N-O, peace. It says no, N-O, Jesus, N-O, peace. No peace. No Jesus means no peace. And then it said underneath that K-N-O-W. No Jesus, you'll know peace. Church, listen to me. As funny as that sign may seem to you, that sign is necessary for you to know peace. You cannot resolve conflict and find peace without a full commitment to Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. It's Gary, Lisa, and Ed Cobb. And as they play softly, I don't know where you are in your relationship with Christ. I don't know if you have one. 